Welcome to my podcast, Why Didn't Anyone Tell Me This? With my guests, we are discussing health issues with an emphasis on reproductive health, answering questions you may have about your health, and debunking some of the many myths around our health. And it's an absolute pleasure today to be talking to Dr. Jen Gunter. And we're going to be talking about her books from the Vagina Bible to the Menopause Manifesto. Now, Jen works as an obs and gynae and a pain medicine physician. Her approach is based on evidence-based medicine with a focus on empathy and the patient experience. She writes a lot about sex, science and social media. She's been called Twitter's resident gynecologist, the Internet's obs and gynae, and one of the fiercest advocates for women's health. Jen has a podcast, a TED podcast called The Body Stuff, and has written three books, which we'll talk about today, The Premi Primer, The Vagina Bible, and The Menopause Manifesto. Jen and I both want to educate people, debunk myths, and discuss taboo subjects. So I'm sure we're going to have a really great conversation today. Hi there, Jen. Hello. Thanks for having me. It's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. So before we go on to talk about your books and podcasts, you do a lot on social media. People say I do a lot, but you do, you do a lot. And you say you want to create a better medical internet, which I totally agree with. But there are not so many clinicians and scientists out there who dedicate their time to social media. And I'm always trying to encourage my colleagues to do so. So what has been your motivation to do this? And what have, what's been the highs and lows of social media for you? Yeah, well, I think, you know, my motivation is is the fact that I see people harmed by what they've read online. And, you know, the difficulty in undoing disinformation, right? So somebody comes in the office and you offer a therapy, which is standard of care, and there's just this barrier to it. And what you realize is this barrier is there because they've, they've, they've read so many things that are incorrect or been exposed to videos that are, that are incorrect about that subject, or they have a completely dis, different dis, uh, sort of understanding of the disease process because of this disinformation. And then I contrast that experience with someone who's come in who maybe got their information from the CDC or from a site that's pretty vetted and how how much faster you know we can move along with care and i i feel badly for people who have been led astray by disinformation you know a lot of this is not intentional on the part of the person who was creating that bad content but some of it is some of it is you know doctors trying to you know get business for practices or you know sell products or have political agendas. And so, you know, this idea that that even just that we have so many health inequalities to begin with, especially in the United States. But this is also another health inequality, the the inability to get access to quality information. And when I had my own experience with prematurity and and my sick kids were so ill and had so many medical problems, this was kind of the birth of the medical internet around that time. And I found myself going down rabbit holes of disinformation. And it made me think that if that could happen to me, who I've always been the person who's been sitting in the back room at, at Grand Rounds with my hand up going, you know, that's not what the study said. Um, you know, the very annoying person. And so I thought, wow, if that can happen to me, wow. Every single person is at risk of this happening to them. And so I just sort of thought after my kids were older and not so critically ill, you know, what could I do to fix that problem? Because I saw how that problem affected me and affected other parents sitting in the waiting room. And so it really helped me see it in a different perspective. And so that was my motivation. And and uh, you're right, it has, it has got much worse with the internet. And it, it was there before, myths were there before. But now it, they're so easily uh, perpetuated into society. And I, I do get a bit frustrated that we've got to spend so much of our energy debunking myths when I'm sure we'd rather spend that energy educating and not trying to undo. As you say, to undo something is a lot more time and energy um, than, than, than not. But, but let's um, we'll come back to that for sure. Let, let's talk about your career 
and what led you to become one of the most outspoken doctors in the world, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I'm just out. I mean, I'm just me. Um, you know, obviously, you know, obviously in the office, I have my my, you know, I'm very respectful of people. And I'm very, you know, my whole my whole thing is is really informed consent. It's your body and it's your choice. But it's not informed consent if you've been given bad information. That's not informed consent, right? You know, if I tell someone that their surgery has a 0% chance of having a complication, they haven't made an informed decision to have that surgery, and that's not fair. So, you know, I think that that's really the driving force for me is that there's people make all kinds of decisions in their lives that I would never personally make. But if they've got the information and they decide that's right for them, that's that's fine, absolutely, informed consent. And so I think one of the big issues that we've been seeing that didn't exist when I was in training, you know, in the 80s and the early 90s, is this really explosion of medical conspiracy theory thinking, right? So yeah, we had disinformation, you know, in the, state, in the States and Canada, which I train in Canada, we used to have this magazine called Reader's Digest. And, you know, at the back, there would be like, you know, a page about putting an onion in your sock, you know, to treat warts or whatever, you know. And so there are those kinds of sort of folksy, I would say, myths that, that were more pervasive, but they didn't metastasize in the way that happens now, right? So, you know, you get 100 influencers on TikTok talking about the same thing, reinforcing the myth over and over and over again. And we know that there's this um, illusory truth effect. The more you hear a myth, the more likely you are to believe it. And so in 1985, if you just read it in Reader's Digest, you probably weren't going to encounter it, you know, again. And so now you read it online and then you encounter it 100 times in the next 48 hours. And it's a totally different situation. And and um, you, you've had this amazing career in obstetrics and gynecology. And what was your motivation to want to become a doctor? Oh, well, I had, um, you know, an interaction with the healthcare system when I was 11. I had a, a, a skateboarding accident and I ruptured my spleen. Um, I laugh about it now because there was a lot about it that was funny in a very tragic, comic way. But I ruptured my spleen, uh, and uh, I found the whole hospital experience incredibly fascinating. I was very precocious. I'm sure that's unsurprising to anybody. But I was 11, but I was probably already 5'8". I'm very tall, so I looked older. And this, the hospital staff treated me like I was an adult, which is probably bad for a lot of 11-year-olds. But for me, it was right. That was the right way to treat me. And so I had to have this angiogram, because this was before ultrasounds existed and before CT scans, right? That, that was it. And so I had to have this emergent angiogram to check my spleen. And they wanted to sedate me. And I said, no, I want to stay awake. I want to see it. I'll behave. I, I'll Trust me, I'll behave. And, um, and I did. And I got to watch the whole angiogram. I just like had the local. And of course, they were all shocked this 11 year old did this, but I was so fascinated. And the radiologist showed me everything on the screen with the spleen. And I just thought, well, this is super cool. And then, um, you know, everything went, I didn't have to have my spleen out, which I was lucky that, about that. But they found out from the angiogram that I had kidney disease. <laughs> so then I had to have all this workup. So my left kidney wasn't functioning correctly. So I had to have all this workup for my left kidney, uh, go back to the hospital for multiple tests and other things and which culminated in me having my kidney removed when I was 12. So, so then I was in the hospital for a week for that. And that's the old time where they cut you in half all the way around. Like I've got this scar that looks like a shark bite. And so, you know, now it would be laparoscopic. Now it wouldn't even happen. Now someone would have had, so have an ultrasound during pregnancy that would have showed the obstruction and it would have been stented at birth and they would never have lost their kidney. So that's the miracle of modern medicine. So, um, but yeah, so I just was so fascinated and the same thing when I was in the hospital, they, the staff, it was a children's hospital, but you know, they spoke with me like an adult. I mean, when I was 11, I used to have to sub at my parents' bridge games. So if they, like my parents played a lot of duplicate bridge and if they were short someone, I had to play. So, you know, I knew how to like, you know, chit chat with the adults, 
Um, and so, yeah, so I just got really interested in it. And I thought, oh, this is super cool. I want to do this. So that's how I got interested in medicine. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a great story. So you went in thinking you'd lose a spleen, but you lost a kidney. Yeah, basically, <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, something that was very powerful for me was, uh, the, so the first appointment we had with a pediatric nephrologist. So my parents are actually from England, um, and my mom uh, had to, you know, she, back in the day of the 11 plus or whatever. So she, um, she left school whenever it ended because she didn't do well on that exam, like I guess age 13 or something around then, and went to work. And so she didn't have a really good understanding of anything that was scientific. Everything that was science-y related like made her kind of panic. And so we're sitting in the pediatric nephrologist's office and he's trying to explain what's wrong with my kidney and she's sitting next to him and she just like doesn't get it. And he said to me, hey, it's your body, you come sit here. And so we switched seats and he explained everything to me. And I was like, yep, I understand. I have no problem, no problem. And, you know, and so then I tried to explain to my mom and I was like, don't worry about it. It's like, makes sense, don't worry. And then years later, when I was in medical school, we had a lecture about the kidney and about they came across, you know, what I had. And it was no different than what I'd heard in the office when I was 11. And that was a really powerful moment for me that you could take something that was that a medical student needed to know. And you could make it in such a way that an 11 year old or 12 year old could understand it. And and that to me felt like, you know, medicine, so much of what we do is not difficult. It's just complex. And you just need someone to explain it to you. Now there's some stuff like how like acid base balance. I'm like, I can never remember that, but that's okay. I'm not a nephrologist, but you know that, and that was, that's kind of been like my governing drive that, that so much of what we tell people is actually not difficult. It's just, they don't have the, the backstory to know it. So how can we pluck out the right things so they can be at that position? So they can be like I was sitting in the office and be able to be informed about what was happening with my body. Because once I, I wasn't scared about any of it because it would all been explained to me. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I always say it's not rocket science. If you're a good teacher, you can explain how the body works to to the public as as happened to you and that's a really great skill of a good teacher and and i think the public now are very thirsty for this they do want to know um so you know we're in, we're in a good place to do this so um your first book book was called the premi is called the premi primer um can you please tell us i know it's a sad story but um i know i know you have have related this before i'd love to hear why you wrote that book Sure. So, you know, the old adage in medicine is, you know, you, you get to have the most complicated thing of your specialty, right? So um, I, uh, I was pregnant with triplets, of course, and um, uh, it had a very complicated pregnancy where I ruptured my membranes at 22 and a half weeks and then delivered my first son who we elected not to resuscitate. And then I managed to stay pregnant, which is not very common. And so then I had a cerclage, a stitch in my cervix, and then I stayed in the hospital for another three and a half weeks. And I got to 25 weeks on, you know, on the day I turned, uh, 26 weeks, on the day I turned 26 weeks, I got really sick and it was clear I had an infection, so I had to be delivered. And so my boys were born at 26 weeks and they were um, 783 grams and 843 grams and um, obviously had a very, you know, they were in the, the NICU for, for about three months. Um, and then on top of that, um, Oliver had a complex cardiac defect. So he had critical pulmonary valve stenosis and a massive ASD. And so was having trouble oxygenating. And so, so he needed to have his valve fixed, but he was too small for the equipment. So that's, you know, one of those conundrums. So he had to get to be 1500 grams for them to do it. And they actually ballooned his valve at 1500 grams, believe it or not. It's stressful for everybody. I think even most stressful for the, the uh, interventional cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist who um, uh, was incredibly skilled, 
I, a God, I, an absolute God as far as I'm concerned, but, uh, but I think it stressed him out as well. Um, and so, uh, yeah. And then my son, Victor was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and had a lot of issues related to that. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time, uh, working with them with, you know, I mean, think in the first three months after they came home, we had something like 67 appointments. And I mean, maybe it was, it was probably more than that. It might be the first month. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was a full-time job. And they were both on oxygen for a year because they had bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And so I just thought, if it's difficult for me, and I'm a doctor, <laughs> how does everybody else manage this? And so that was why I decided I wanted to write a book. I wanted to try to help other people because I found myself, you know, you get to know all the other families who were sort of in the NICU at the same time, because you're all at the retinopathy of prematurity appointments, and you're all at the pulmonologist, and you're all, you know, you're all sort of see each other at all these different specialty appointments over the sort of the next year or so, because nobody really tells you, you think when you get through the NICU, that you're just going to power through that. And it's going to be that, but it's not. That's just the start. And uh, and so I found myself sitting in the waiting room, you know, having people saying, well, I just don't like understand what my doctor said. And I'm like, okay, but I think they mean this. So ask this question. And so I just found myself kind of basically doing medical translation, um, you know, in a way in, in the waiting rooms. And so I just thought, you know, people need, um, people need like a textbook, but for them. And so that's kind of when this whole idea about basically writing medical textbooks, but in a way that, you know, that's relatable and so you can understand for the public kind of came to me that, that people need guidebooks. And so that's why I wrote the preemie primer. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And that turning around a, a negative situation into something really positive where you've helped other people it is just amazing. Um, my book, I, I did start writing my um, fertility book, before I had fertility treatment, but <clears throat> then I went through seven years of fertility treatment to get my kids and then felt that it was really, really important to be able to help people understand what they would need to go through if, if they were in that situation as well. So the Vagina Bible, I've got a copy here. <laughs> uh. Um, uh, really, you know, it, it's, it is unbelievable. You know, you, you start, as I started my book, by explaining anatomy. And it's still so amazing that we don't know, we don't know enough about women's anatomy and it's 2023. And I get very frustrated about people not using the right words correctly. And sometimes I think maybe we should just give up and call it all a vagina. Um, but I'm holding out for the vulva. I'm really <laughs> holding out. Um, and the clitoris, wow. It, I mean, it's such an amazing story that we really are only just starting to understand that this what we all said was a little a little bulb is now not it's a huge wonderful beautiful creation so yeah. how how do you think about this whole issue around around female anatomy and even i think i saw someone say that that originally they wouldn't be able to, to promote your book because it was called vagina and it was it's considered as a dirty word a, a offensive word which is ridiculous yeah, when the book first came out, uh, both Twitter and Facebook wouldn't take paid ads for it, which is ridiculous. I mean, the whole idea that that somehow now I I understand that you know when you put in requests that there might be an automatic flag of very specific words because that's how computerized systems work. But then what you should have then is a human <laughs> looking at your rejected ones to make sure that you haven't kicked something out because there's a lot of doctors on social media, right? So it's not as if there, if there were no doctors on Twitter and Facebook, you know, I could maybe understand that that would catch their sort of, you know, porn filter. Although those aren't words typically used, you know, in, you know, in pornography, but whatever, that aside, you'd think that they would have someone go, oh, the author is Dr. Gunter, okay. Um, so yeah, it took, it was really fascinating. And my publisher then resubmitted the ads with different, all, you know, all different wordings and all the ones that didn't have vagina in got accepted. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And it's so like their body parts. Um, it's so, it's so fascinating to me. And obviously as somebody in gynecology who says these words every single day, to me, it's like, saying vagina or vulva is like saying 
eyebrow or, you know, elbow. It's just, it's the same. And, and the thing is, is obviously if you don't say words, then, then the implication is it's shameful. And that affects how people talk about their body parts. You know, I mean, I actually, my big impetus for writing the vagina Bible was the number, the number of people who I've seen in my career who've been mistreated because they said they had a vaginal itch. And so their doctor assumed it was in their vagina. And, and then they come and referred to me because I do tertiary care, you know, vulvar and vaginal conditions. And the first question I asked them is, okay, is it on the outside where your clothes touch the skin or is it on the inside? It's the first question I asked. And I would, 50% of people had an external problem. They didn't have a vaginal problem at all. Yet some of them had had years and years of vaginal products and this and that. And one visit and they're fixed. And so this whole idea that just informing people about their body was an, you know, was an act of empowerment, you know, really became vital for me that, um, that, that we need to, people need to be able to, if you can't describe what part isn't working, how can you get it fixed? I mean, you know, if somebody, if imagine if the repair guy is coming to my house and my roof is leaking, but I can't tell him it's my roof. And all I can say is, well, there's water in my house. Okay. Yeah. So like where from the sink, from the toilet, from the kitchen, from the bathroom, from the roof, from the floor, I, there's water in my house. Right. So imagine if we didn't have words to describe something like that, well, it's the same for the body, but we shouldn't be in that situation. And it's true. Women are not, they don't understand what's normal and what's not normal. So she said itching, odor, um, what what their vulva looks like, all this surgery. So reading reading your book, um, I was crossing my legs at the, <laughs> the chapter with uh, all the genital procedures, and and um, it's just unbelievable. And and I wanted to pick up about pubic hair. So I'm with you. I'm a big fan of pubic hair. I have pubic hair, everyone. I've I've said it before. Um, I, I work with Professor Sarah Crichton and. She has a lot of women come to her clinic, ask for labia reduction. And she's always been convinced it's because they're getting rid of pubic hair. They said things like, but people at the gym can see my big labia. <laughs> what are they doing? I, they're doing a hands. I don't know what they're doing in the gym. Um, and she feels that a lot of women feel they've got irritation in that area. And her, she thinks a lot of it's because they haven't got pubic hair. Um, removing this pubic hair is just, it should be there. So how do you, how do you, tell us more about pubic hair. Yeah, well, I mean, the analogy I make to people is, you know, you, you have your eyebrows for a reason, right? So it stops the sweat from dripping down your forehead into your eyes. And over the years, we have different, you know, beauty ideals related to eyebrows and shapes change and because that's what people are like. And now that's the same for the, you know, pubic hair, except, you know, the origin of that is really, you know, the of sort of n having no pubic hair being the standard, you know, kind of comes out of, you know, these blue laws where, you know, nudity or, was showing pubic hair, right? So, was, so the more you could show without pubic hair, the more in, in a strip show you could show, right? So now people get to do again with their body, whatever they want. But the number of people that I see who have chronic irritation, um, that's related to removing pubic hair because it's traumatizing to the skin surface, right? So if you wax, if you shave, if you thread, you've, you've changed the surface of the skin, you've changed the acid mantle of the skin. And it's so fascinating to me that everybody wants a natural product. But then you say, well, but this is actually, you know, your pubic hair for a reason. It, traps odor, it traps moisture to keep the skin hydrated, and it's a physical barrier. And if you want to use it, that you remove it, that's okay, that's your choice, but you may also then have to accept that you might have some chronic irritation from that. So for example, you might have to moisturize daily, and you might not have to do that in your 20s, but by the time you get to be 40 and your skin starts to dry out, you know, that might become a different issue for you. And then, of course, there's injuries related to removal and ingrown hairs, because um, that's how hairs get ingrown is that when they're, you know, generally when they're removed, when they start growing back up, they get trapped and then they curl back under. And skin trauma also is related to that as well. So again, it's about being informed. And, you know, you can use a trimmer if you want to, to keep it short. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, I, I think that 
people have no idea or a very limited idea about the wide variety of how labia look. Think about our faces. No two faces are alike. People have big eyebrows, they have small eyebrows, they have turned up noses, they have, um, you know, they have uh, noses that aren't turned up, they have big lips, they have small lips, I have a tiny top lip, they have oval faces, they have square, they have, we are, we are so okay with people having this whole spectrum of how their faces look. And then when it comes to the vulva, you know, we have a very one specific ideal. Um, and it's always amazing to me that the ideal is smaller because labia are part of your sexual response organs, right? So they have specialized nerve endings and they get engorged. And so trimming the labia is equivalent to trimming the penis. And for this whole idea about people can see me in the gym, well, why is that okay for men to have a bulge? Why is it okay for like Mick Jagger to go on stage, all these guys to wear skin tight jeans and, and you can see all their junk through it? Why is that sexy? But it's not sexy for a woman, right? And it doesn't make any sense to me at all. And certainly, you know, in the 70s, that was like a desired look. We used to, you know, lie down with jeans so tight that you'd have to use pliers to pull them up and you could see the shape of everything. And that was kind of the point, I think now looking back at the time, you know, I like when I was 17, I didn't get it, but you know, so it's, it's, it's really, I think, very, a regressive idea, um, that, that you're, you know, that you're want to tell people that, that they should have smaller labia. And so obviously it's people's bodies. And if that's what they want and they're informed about it, you know, I mean, that's, that's cosmetic surgery, but the majority of people who, who think it's causing symptoms, there's usually another cause. Do you, are they not worried about uh, reducing their orgasms? You know, that's an area that's so important for, for an orgasm. And it, I always feel it's like consenting female genital mutilation. Well, it is. Well, in the United States, under the age of 18, it is considered female genital mutilation. Um, and so, I, you know, I, <laughs> um, I, it's, you know, if I saw somebody who had it done when they were 16 or 17, I would report that surgeon to the police, I would call. Um, so, you know, I think that a lot of it, certainly where I live, came from mothers, like bringing their daughters in. And I'm like, stop looking at it. What is wrong with you? Like, leave her alone. Um, so you're going to give her, a, you know, a body image issue. So I think it's, again, it's related to all these ideas that are presented online about what's considered normal. You know, we, there's like sort of, you know, tabloid type papers down here that, you know, that kind of promote it and they interview doctors who do it. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a huge moneymaker. And, you know, I think that you have to be very careful about cosmetics that are all about reducing the size of sexual organs for women. Um, and again, I'd say, I always just make that analogy. It's the same thing. Could you imagine a world where we would say, we need to trim the size of a penis so it looks better in tight pants? There's no world, there's no, there's, that would never, those sentence would never exist. Could you imagine if I published a journal article about that? People would be like, what are you talking about? Um, and so whenever something comes out that I think that's just, patriarchy. I translate it into what I call men. So I, you know, I say penis instead of vulva and I'll, and it sounds awful when you say it that other way. So I just think it's important for us to, to, to think about what the messaging actually means behind it. And we don't have data about how this affects sexual function down the road. And the thing that concerns me is with menopause, we often lose volume in the labia minora and we get a little bit of loss of volume. And so what is going to happen? We don't know what's going to happen to people who have these labial reductions in their 20s. We don't know what symptoms they may be having in their 50s, right? So there's some potential concern there. I, I, I've never thought about that. I know there's been concern we've discussed in our department about uh, delivery, you know, delivering your baby. Um, there can be complications with the scar tissue. But yeah, the, the, the menopause is really important. Can I go back? You said something earlier about, do people really have their pubic hair threaded? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I think so. I don't know. Um, somebody brought it up once and then sugaring and, you know, all that wow. kind of stuff. So, um, you know, and it's, again, people get to modify their bodies how they want. Um, and I have patients who choose to do that and accept that they have to use chronic steroids, you know, um, twice a week to maintain their, their, you know, and that's what they want. And, um, you know, there's also people though, who wear shoes that are uncomfortable, um, but they like how they look and, you know, it's a choice and, and I'm okay with that. I think it's just the obvious trade-off with the shoes is you, you know, you know, what's, you know, what's uncomfortable or not, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's people who will do that. I mean, and certainly, you know, I wore pants that were very uncomfortable when I was younger because I thought that was the trend, but you know, you can stop doing that. Right. So it's reversible. I live in Birkenstocks. <laughs> um, staying on the vagina. So as you explained, it is a self cleaning oven. And then we've got this big industry now, which I know upsets both of us, these lotions, potions, well, we've talked about labial reduction, but other, you know, steaming, all these other things, not helped by our dear friend, Gwyneth <laughs> and Goop. I'm so on your page about that. I couldn't believe it. On, what I, on one of her documentaries, she seemed shocked, actually, that the vulva was a vulva. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't know whether, I've heard you mention it as well. I don't know whether she really, did she really not know it was called a vulva? Um, unbelievable. But what would you say to women? I know what you will say, but I'd love you to say what you would say to women who are thinking of using a jade egg or steaming or any of this other, what I would call mumbo jumbo uh, yeah. for treatment. So, you know, I, there's sort of two issues here. So a lot of that is remnants from medicine from before we had germ theory, right? where people didn't know. So they put astringents in the vagina because women were considered too wet, not like because they had vaginal discharge, but everything in their body was too wet. That was the, you know, when you go back to the sort of the, the balancing humors, you know, sort of pre like early 1800s and earlier. So a lot of these vaginal therapies that, you know, have been around for a long time are there for reasons that, you know, we, we know are completely false and actually are harmful today. So we have this long history of putting drying astringent things into the vagina. We also have this long history of a dry vagina being a good vagina, right? Because if sex is painful and not pleasurable, then you're a virgin and you're desired, right? If you happen to be sexually excited or, you know, then obviously you've had sex before and you're a ruined person. So, so you have all these competing, so this back history of astringents because that was the medical therapy. This idea that a dry, tight vagina is, you know, socially desirable is part of our history, a long part of our history as well. And then you have into that mix as well, um, illegal abortions and a lot of these vaginal products, you know, in, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s were sort of offered as euphemisms for abortifacients and stuff like that. So you have all of that crossover. And then you have this kind of, you know, concept of, you know, any smell from a woman is obviously abnormal because um, clearly scrotum smells like flowers, I guess. Um, and, uh, you know, so that you have all of these interests that have that have now been sort of, they've given us a historical idea that maybe these products are valid, right? Because, you know, my mother would have heard it, your mother would have heard it, her mother would have heard it, right? For different reasons. And then, you know, we now have it commercialized into, you know, sprays that, you know, suggest that you, you know, you should smell like a pina colada. And, and so it's just, it, they're capitalizing, all these products are capitalizing on this, this history. And they're all harmful. Every single one of them, it, you know, it's every single study shows that any attempts to clean the vagina inside, including with water, disturbs the ecosystem. So um, it's, it, it's hard to get that message across because if you walk into an American drugstore and you knew nothing, say you came from another planet and you're like, I'm going to learn about people from a drugstore and you walk in and you see all the shelves often labeled feminine hygiene, right? And not even menstrual products, but feminine hygiene. So you see pads and tampons and incontinence things because they're all for women. And, um, and then you see all these sprays and douches and stuff. 
and there's no aisle for men. You would think that women are gross and disgusting and there's something wrong with their bodies. Of course you would think that. Why wouldn't you? There's, there's nothing in that drugstore to say otherwise. Why they don't sell special wipes for men. I'm like, what? Do you think women don't know how to wipe themselves after going to the bathroom? Like what? Like what is that? They're not babies. And a lot of this is the babyfication, right? Of women, the infantilizing of women, that that baby wipes have somehow become standard for wiping yourself. And I'm like, um, I can't even understand as a gynecologist who specializes in the vulva why, why that would be needed unless you have incontinence. And if you have incontinence and you're out of the house, I can understand how those wipes would be helpful for you, which is how they're used for babies because babies are incontinent, right? So um, it, it sort of becomes this messages are everywhere. And the word vagina is as Gwyneth Paltrow said, like a cultural firestorm, you put it in a headline and people are going to click. So it's a very complicated social problem and it's definitely not getting any better, which I find really fascinating given our obsession with the word natural. It, it just amazed me, even in the broader health, not just in women's health, that we have so many products now that are harming us. I, I just, I just, I'm, um, flabbergasted that we have you know even now things like the yo low fat fat yogurts you know people have said they're not healthy and they're bad for us they got too much sugar but they're everywhere you go in those supermarket shelves it's full of things that are bad for us you know sugar oh my god you can't go in you can't go in any i was thinking yes i was in a petrol station a uh, gas station and i thought you you can't buy any healthy snack in here you yeah. can just buy something that's really toxic and it's it's the same with with women's health and you mentioned um menstrual products and this is a this is obviously a really big one so you know when when we were growing up we had tampons and sanitary towels but now they've got uh period pants and a menstrual cup so how how do you feel about some of these new products we've got on the menstrual products arena yeah, I think um, I think most of them are amazing. I think choices are great, uh, and uh, you know some people love menstrual cups, some people hate them. Some people love tampons, some people hate them. Some people love menstrual discs, which are you know sit higher up than a cup. Some people hate them. Some people like pads. Some people hate them. Period underwear, um, a little bit expensive, um, and maybe not always an option because you've got to have several pairs. But fantastic backup. I can't imagine, for example, a better option for a young, a young person who's just started their period and doesn't really know maybe when it's going to come, wanting to wear underwear like that so you have protection. I mean, oh my gosh, you know, especially considering how irregular periods are at the beginning. Or someone who has a heavy period and they like to wear a tampon, but you know, sometimes they have a bit of leakage and they don't want to wear, um, you know, they don't want to wear a, a panty liner. So, so many options. I'm absolutely on board for that. I think that um, one thing that I have seen is kind of this overemphasis on menstrual cups. And I appreciate that from a environmental standpoint that they are better. However, um, it's fascinating to me that there's this emphasis on menstrual cups and not on reusable diapers right? Because diapers are a massive, massive landfill issue as well. And it, it's always, to me, the burden seems to always fall on women. And it's so difficult for so many people to manage their menstruation in lots of different ways. Um, I think that there are so many other areas where we could be more mindful of the environment and let people choose what works best for them because a lot of people are just trying to manage through the day and some people find cups uncomfortable. They really do. Um, or they just don't like them. Um, and you know, I think that we have to be really careful and we need to, we need to make sure that, that everybody feels whatever choice they want to use is a fine choice for them. I also feel we need to make sure that every choice is affordable. You know, we wouldn't want somebody not being able to, um, to buy a cup if it's too expensive for them, um, or you know, buy menstrual underwear or tampons. I mean, we know period poverty is such an issue. So I just think people need to have all the options. And, um, and maybe once everybody has all the options available to them at a price that's affordable or preferably free, you know, then we can start having discussions about, you know, about, you know, 
what what people really prefer um, and you know how you know how maybe environmentally we can move forward but i think right now we're because there's so much period poverty and so much inequity with products the messaging really needs to be whatever works for you yeah and this we're lucky now there's some great schemes out there trying to tackle period poverty and and some of the things you mentioned like the menstrual cups give some more options um in some of these developing countries and and i am um, i'm sure i'm not the only one who ha i leaked a few times in in school and got blood all over my school skirt and was mortified and and you know having those other things like per menstrual pants i would definitely have have worn those while i was at school as as added protection um, yeah, I think they're genius. I, yeah. I think the idea of the menstrual pants are genius. They also have them for incontinence too, by the way. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to get a massive leak, but for somebody who's got some low grade leakage, they're a great product. And again, those should be available to everybody. And, um, you know, it's this idea, it's so many, I see so much vulvar irritation from incontinence, from people not wearing the right products. Um, and, you know, I see ulcerations on the skin, you know, just skin breakdown, right? If you're bathed in urine constantly, that can cause a problem. So, you know, we also need to be thinking about the, uh, you know, the other end of the reproductive spectrum. Um, oh, it's not always at the other end. I mean, people have incontinence in their 20s and 30s. So um, I think that we need to make sure that we have equitable access to incontinence products as well, because I know it's probably understudied, but I would bet that we have incontinence product poverty as well. That, that's a really, really good point. And so we've talked about some really positive products for women's health. I've um, been doing a lot of um, research around the femtech arena. So what sort of new products are being developed? A lot of them digital products and apps, et cetera. And I have a bit of a concern, really, of where this is heading. I've I've heard a lot of pitches from uh, mo mostly um, women who have got an idea about a product. Some of them have got um, funding for these products, and and I don't get it. I just I'm like, you know, I've asked them, for example, what they're what they're thinking of measuring, um, what evidence they've got that they're actually measuring what they say they're measuring it's going to do what they say it's going to do and I normally hit a brick wall they haven't validated anything so I just worry that in the next 10 years that we're going to have the femtech arena flooded with all these what sound like great ideas but in my view are not really empowering women but they're exploiting women and we're going to get an overload of these bright ideas have you have you come across some of these things? Yeah, I haven't seen one thing from Femtech that made me think, wow, you're really solving a problem. Um, <laughs> I actually have a very, very negative view of it. Um, I do not believe that you can help health if you have VC funding, venture capital funding. So venture capital funding um, is, you know, these big investment groups that are going to give you, I mean, to them, $10 million is like chump change, like four or five million is nothing. But they're expecting to see 10 times their return on that. So what kind of product in medicine gives 10 times its return in five or six years? Uh, you can't go through the kind of studies you need to show that it works. Um, and I'm not saying that pharma doesn't make a ton of money from their products, but their products don't come out in four or five years, right? You know, it's 20 years to bring a drug to pipeline. And, um, and along those 20 years, they might've started with 10 candidate drugs and had so many that fall out, right? So yeah, I'm very concerned about this. Like if you have an idea, instead of getting venture capital funding to help women, what you need to do is get funding for a lab or a researcher to study your product so we can understand if it really does what you claim and can have the outcomes. Now that's a slower trajectory, but if your goal is to help people, that's the trajectory. If your goal is to get rich, it's VC funding, right? That's really all it is. And certainly, you know, in the US, we see these um, virtual menopause clinics that have popped up all with VC funding, I'm pretty sure. They all sell scammy products as part of it. One of them sells estrogen face cream because nobody gets rich writing prescriptions for estrogen. 
You're only going to make money selling products that have a markup that are useless, right? So other ones offer, you know, um, we'll come in and we'll, you know, we'll, we have, we'll design supplements for you. So they, they're making their money in another way. The prescribing hormones is the hook to get you in the door right? So people have to be very, very careful. There's these products out there for the pelvic floor that are like $400 that are supposed to replace Kegels and things like that. There's no quality studies with them. And so you're expecting the consumer to spend the $400 and maybe it's going to help and maybe it's going to not. But then I'm like, well, for $400, you could have probably had three visits with a pelvic floor physical therapist. And would you be in the same position? Now, you know, I'm not saying that, that these devices maybe are useless. Maybe they're really great. We don't know. But it's very difficult for me to tell someone to spend $400 on a product when I have no good data. We're, we're in a place in time where anecdote is unacceptable for a product like that. It's completely unacceptable. And that's what all these ideas lead to, you know, oh, well, in my experience, this happened to me. So I'm going to, I've designed a line of boric acid suppositories. We see that all the time. I, yes. And then we see all this disinformation from that. And it's like, you, you know, you, you have it all completely wrong and boric acid doesn't balance the pH in the vagina. That's not how it works. It's actually a disinfectant. Um, and think of it like bleach. Uh, and uh, just like we do use bleach in some very specific areas of medicine, right? You know, bleach soaks on, you know, on specific infections. That doesn't mean that you should be bathing in bleach every day, right? It's kind of a difference. And so, so we see these ideas that, that may, may have had some little medical validity in a small situation and someone without the medical training then expanding that to everybody. We see people capitalizing on the microbiome, right? So we see all these areas and I'm like, VC funding, sorry, I have yet to see something for, because if you really wanted to help people, you would want quality research. You would want to say, you know what? We published our data in the New England Journal of Medicine, bitch, take that. So, you know, now you know our product is great. Like there's no incentive to do that research because the product, because if your product doesn't come out top, you know, then you've wasted all your money and your, your investors aren't going to get their 10 times return. So I'm it's, very skeptical. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's so good to hear you say that. You know, I always say, what's the mechanism? They can't normally answer that. Where have you published? How have you validated it? Um, and th they, they'd stop at the first <laughs> the first fence. They can't say that. And, you know, we've got um, lots of tests. We've got fertility tests. Loads of people are marketing menopause tests, uh, tests for everything. And I always say, if we've got a test, if you've got a test where the result doesn't actually change anything, your advice or treatment wouldn't make any difference. Why would you do it? Why would you then go and spend 300 pounds on a test? That's not going to change anything. So yeah. we, it, it's, I mean, and the list goes on and on and on and you know, all the apps and everything. It, it's, I think we're, I think we're getting ourselves in a real minefield. So I think, I think the public need to, you know, sit and take note of some of this new technology that's coming out um, I mean, and I think do. about that. I think some of the issue is, you know, obviously medicine has done a bad job of listening to what people want and a bad job of communication, but these gaps are being exploited. And I think fertility tests is a great one. I mean, you know, the ASRM is very clear, um, you know, doing AMH testing for fertility is not indicated. If you're seeing a fertility specialist and pursuing infertility, it has a value in that specific setting. But it does not have value if you're 24 or 34 just to see where you are on the infertility you know, pipeline. And, you know, I've had people be angry at me because I wouldn't order the test. And I'm like, it's not going to tell you what you want. And so I, it's it would be unethical of me and, or people who go and get the test and then they, they stop their they stop their pill because they're like, oh, my God, I'm infertile or I'm going to not be able to get pregnant. And then they're pregnant a month later. And, and then now they have to deal with the fact they're pregnant when they didn't want to be. Or what if somebody got that result and thought, oh, okay, I've got plenty of time. And next year they're infertile, right? So there really is potential for harm here as well. And once you tell people that whole story, they're like, oh, 
But look, I get it. We all want there to be magic. I would have loved to have been able to take a test when I was 30 to say, hey, where am I on the my ovary you know, scale so I can plan? I would love that. But wanting it and it not being true, you know, are two different things. I totally, totally agree. It would be great, but it's not there. And if it's not there, then we shouldn't do something that's really substandard. And and they're marketed as empowerment. And I really think they're exploitation. Oh, they're absolutely. Really... It's exploitation. It's absolute exploitation. I mean, you know, and so then what happens is professional societies are playing catch up, writing, you know, guidelines to counteract that when, you know what, we should be doing more research. And, you know, if you had $5 million of VC funding, instead of using it to design your mail-in tests and your slick website, why didn't you do some research with that money? I mean, we all know the answer. And and I, I've, I've, know, I've seen you say this as well. The trouble is that when we produce the guidelines from the societies um, and the recommendations and et cetera, they're ignored and, and everyone still does this. I, I've done a lot of work in the IVF add-ons area um, oh. historically. And, you know, so it's, we've had a paper out this week uh, about that. And, you know, we, we, um, the European society, we've got our guidelines. We've spent years writing guidelines, not recommending. There's only one that we recommend, but the rest we don't recommend. And um, I worked with the HFEA in the UK, the government authority about this. And the trouble is that, the the clinicians the fertility clinics they ignore them and they still sell these things to their patients so it's it is frustrating we're in a frustrating area when we're spending our energy trying to overcome these myths and they're just getting perpetuated it's it is really it's, frustrating it's so predatory that's what it really is i mean in the states we're seeing people i think getting platelet-rich plasma injections into their ovaries. And I mean, there was a great study out years ago showing acupuncture didn't do anything for the endometrium. People still offer it, um, you know, and and it, you're, you're preying on people's hope. And I find that really cruel. Um, as somebody who, you know, spent a lot of time sitting by a ventilator in the intensive care unit, you know, hoping um, I think preying on hope is just cruel. Um, and if you have an infertility clinic, you're already making money hand over fist. Like, is it not enough? Is it not enough? And I think what happens is your competitor clinic offers it. So then you feel that you have to. And then what happens is medical care lowers, the standard of care lowers because everybody needs to be doing it. And I just... The fact that people aren't offended, physicians aren't offended by this really bothers me a lot. Um, and I think that we need we need to have our professional organizations and the government, you know, watching out more for consumers because when you're trying to get pregnant, it's you're incredibly vulnerable. If you're sick, you're incredibly vulnerable. I mean, being unwell puts you in a very vulnerable position. And it's, it's just, it's really sad that, that this sort of unfettered capitalism is, you know, it's, it's very ironic to me that the people doing the best here are in big pharma. It's very ironic, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because they can't make false claims about their products. They can't do these things. And again, I'm not saying that big pharma is, you know, is, is the, the people that, that they would do the same thing if they didn't have the regulations. That's kind of what I'm getting at is that regulations work. Um, and you, you know, I personally believe that every single product offered to a person should have to pass the same muster as a pharmaceutical. And if that happened, we'd see all the supplements stop. We'd see all these things stop. Um, but, you know, I'm not in charge. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that. all the supplements, et cetera. You know, it's, it's just, it's so, so, so unfair. But let's move on to the menopause manifesto. Um, I loved it, really loved it and agreed. I always, when I'm reading a book like this thing, am I going to disagree with anything? But I, but I didn't. And um, let's oh, start. Great. With, yeah. <laughs> Let's start with the wise woman hypothesis. Um, yeah. I, you've worked, you've used words such as women should be flourishing, and we, the menopause is a marvel and not something we should be ashamed of. And you also say older women are amazing, and I totally 
agree. We we are. I I feel. I I keep saying this again and again. I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. Well, I think me and menstrual cycles and those fluctuating hormones did not go well together. I feel now I'm I'm postmenopausal, very postmenopausal. I I really feel wonderful. So we've got lots to talk about here. So let's start. Um, people don't want seem to want to hear any positive stories. I know we love watching TV that's depressing and violent, and 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 it's almost like this. You know, we we don't want to read a book where it's a happy ending. People rarely talk about life post menopause and how wonderful it is. Is that quite a few people doing this now, and it's great. We've got a movement coming. Um, but why do you think people want to hear these negative? menopause narratives and they don't want to hear the good things oh i think because we're all steeped in patriarchy which is you know ageism is a big part of that and uh you know i think you know historically you know this idea that you're no longer a breeder so you don't have any value right and and i think that you know it's we're in a very ageist society and the only people that are aging well are the ones who don't look like they're aging right and you know we sell anti-aging products and uh, so I think there's a big part of that. And I think that, you know, we've seen an unfortunate resurgence of sort of 1960s medicine, where there are people basically, you know, pushing this false narrative that all women die before the age of menopause. So menopause is a disease. And all I can say is, if you're saying that as a physician, then you're ignorant. And you have literally read nothing on the subject. You're the opposite of an expert. It means that you don't understand the difference between um, average, you know, between average life expectancy and, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's so ludicrous. I'm like, oh, were there never grandmothers before? You never heard of a grandmother? Is that something totally foreign to you? You know, people didn't have kids when they were 12 and be grandmothers when they were 20. We didn't start, historically, people didn't start reproducing until after the age of 16. And usually not, you know, the usually first birth was later than that. And so this whole idea, it's so, it's so bizarre to me. Um, it's based in a book from the US in the 1960s called Feminine Forever. And that's where that whole idea was advanced. And it was actually a big pharma talking point, which I find is very interesting. Uh, because if you have a new form of hormones to sell, they were now available in, in um, good oral formulations that, you know, that were dose standardized. You need to make menopause a disease. And so, you know, and the worst disease of all, one that makes women unattractive to men. So there's a lot of awful history with that. And I find I'm personally offended by any physician that chose that narrative. Yeah, I, I quote that book as well. And it, it, what it says is really, it's unbelievable. But we have people in the UK, um, very prominent website that says very clearly that the menopause is a hormone deficiency disorder. Um, yeah. I, I t certainly don't believe it. I've, I've had to debate it in our Institute before, uh, people couldn't believe that we were even debating it, but, um, I can tell you that I slightly lost the votes. I, there were slightly more saying that it was a disorder and that was in our Institute, Institute for Women's Health staff felt that it was a disorder. So, so they, yeah, they think puberty is a disorder too. Exactly. It, it's, <laughs> it's, I, I, maybe I got too passionate in my argument, but, um, you know, I, and, and, and my, op my opposer, uh, instead of quoting research papers was quoting newspapers, um, reports in, you know, this newspaper had said this and I, it was unbelievable, but people, people do believe that. And as you say, this is big pharma. If we are saying it's a disorder, then surely you're saying that every woman should need, and in, in the UK, we call it hormone replacement therapy, which I think is a really bad term. And, you know, yeah. you, you in the States, you use menopause hormone therapy. And I think we, I'm on a bit of a crusade now. I think we should really try to stop calling it HRT and move, move that over. And also HRT in the UK is called HRT, if someone's uh, transitioning their, changing their gender uh, or mm -hmm. confirming their gender. Um, so we're getting very confused with different words. I know they're the same 
hormones involved, but it's, it's, it's really getting confusing. Right. Yeah. And that's a more appropriate use of that term, right? Yeah. So HRT and, and HRT would be a fine use for someone with primary ovarian insufficiency because you are in fact then treating a condition, but it's not a replacement because you're not supposed to have high levels of estrogen when you're 60. I mean, you're just not. So yeah, it's really fascinating to me that people, people think this and this whole idea of menopause being a disease. Well, it's one that makes women live longer than men because since the 1900s, women's life expectancy has been longer than men's. So how's that a disease? That sounds like, like maybe it's, I, I always say, well, isn't it a disease that men don't get menopause because they have a shorter life expectancy? I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I'm going gonna... to, sorry, go sorry. ahead. I was going to say, if you're going to argue disingenuously, there's a lot of way. I mean, I, I can get in the, I can get in the trenches and 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 be as disingenuous as with the best of them. It's just you know ethics. So yeah, it's it's fascinating to me. Bias exists everywhere, obviously. So I've had so because we're sending messages to people that they don't need that are wrong. I have had so many arguments on social media with women saying to me, but. Um, we're not producing estrogen and progesterone anymore and we've got to put it back. And, you know, it seems that they think every woman's the same and we're not the same. And everyone's had different, we've got different genetics. We've got different nutrition, exercise, sleep. We'll come on to that in a minute. And we've got um, different lifestyles and we've had different things go wrong with us along the way. So to think that this hormone replacement therapy or, or menopause replacement therapy or menopause hormone therapy is going to be the answer for everybody. And and it seems as well, people are saying it's the answer for everything. So suicidal thoughts, preventing dementia, preventing heart disease. And I, I think this is a very, very dangerous narrative to suggest that if you're on hormone therapy, you're not going to get some of these chronic diseases. I think in five or 10 years, we're going to see, or 10, 20 years or more, we're going to see women on hormone therapy who thought they were never going to get these diseases because that's what their doctor told them. And then they have, and you know what, along the way, they weren't looking after themselves. They weren't sleeping well, exercising, looking after their nutrition. So I think we could even possibly see a higher rate of some of these chronic conditions in those that are on hormone therapy. Yeah. And I think one of the big problems that, that you have in the UK and we have to a lesser extent in in, in the States is people prescribing over the licensed doses, right? And so all the data we have on safety is with the licensed doses. Is that we don't have and it, so so even if you're gonna argue about dementia, which the studies do not show that we do not recommend estrogen to prevent dementia, but if you're gonna argue that all of your data is from people using the equivalent of a hundred microgram patch or less. That's all the data is from that all the data for the heart, all the data for everything. We do not know what these supraphysiologic doses could do long-term. And that's a significant concern. Um, I always remind people that a hundred microgram patch is the equivalent of the average level of estrogen that you would have had throughout the menstrual cycle, right? considering it's lower <laughs> at the beginning and higher when you ovulate, goes up and down. So this idea that you should be replaced if you're gonna use that term with a higher dose make any sense at all you know you're not treating a deficiency if you're treating a deficiency if you're really going to believe that narrative you should be sticking with the standard levels right so so using these levels that are birth control pill equivalent or higher we have no idea how that's going to affect your clotting we have no idea how that's going to affect the blood vessels in your brain for vascular dementia we have no idea so it's it's very concerning I, I don't know if the women have been told that they're being treated as guinea pigs, but I, I fear that they don't. And and it's not a research study. Um, it's the same as with some of the fertility treatments we mentioned earlier. You know, we hear I hear the same arguments with the menopause clinics. They say, oh, but in our clinic, the women are telling us this and that and the other. It's anecdotal evidence. And I, I always say the same thing. If you've got evidence, please publish it. And they can't publish it because it's not yeah. a scientific study. It's anecdotal evidence, which means nothing. We, we can't function. So, like, that's not evidence-based medicine. My answer to people like that is I'm quoting clinical trials and you're pivoting 